decisions they can make because, like what he's talking about with prison, mm -hmm. going to prison the rest of your life or being killed. When I was banging, I knew that. Mm -hmm. I knew, you know, there, I, a lot of times I thought through it before I wanted this, I wanted to get life in prison for this. You get killed doing it. And still accepting that fact mm -hmm. that I could go to prison for the rest of my life or I could die. But I got a lot of friends. I can't talk to them once they're dead. But a lot of them that's doing life in prison now as you mature and get older, and that's one of the things when I talk to these young people, try to get them to understand, you might, you, you might, you're not thinking things through clearly right now, mm -hmm. but 10, 15 years from now, 20 years from now when you're in prison, then all of a sudden you wake up, oh, what I've done, you know? Um, uh, we had a, a young man that, uh, he, he was 17 years old, he got 100 years of life in the scholar. And we had him uh, call from prison and talk with the youth. He's like 27 now, about 10. And one thing he was telling the young people, he said, when he was 17, and where he is now, he said, he's not even the same person. He's somebody completely different. So a lot of decisions that they're making, and they might be thinking, I don't care, but they don't really understand the decisions yeah. that they make. And I think to be able to bring them to a level of maturity and comprehend and clearly understand what they're, the decision that they're making. Because you know, you could look and see your homeboys in prison. Oh, I can go. You know, like he was saying, you know, that's like I'm going. What do you say? So I'm some whatever it was. It, it's kind of like Disneyland for you in a sense. So I'm going to homes, you know, and, uh, and, and and so going to prison, you know, a lot of times. Oh, I can handle that, you know. Um, I think dying is is a little bit more, you know, if if, uh, if reality really set in, that can wake people up because no one can no one can come back from the dead and tell us how that is. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. but. That's why we call these young people their high risk takers, you know, because they're taking those risks of going to prison for the rest of their life or uh, being killed. And I think that if we can really crack into that uh, and wake them up and get them to see that, bring them to a level of maturity to understand really what they're doing, I think you, you can make a big difference, at least in their decision making and start reconsidering uh, what the life that they live. For sure. And one of the questions was, what are some of the signs that kids are being groomed for gangs? Is there anything that we as providers can look out for? I would say, uh, 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 at least from my experience, is uh, so to watch social media. And the reason why I say that is because uh, they post a lot of stuff on there of, of who they're with, uh, what's going on. Uh, I was able to intervene in a young man's life uh, because he was posting on Facebook that he's going to jump in. <laughs> and Instagram too, you guys. A lot of on Instagram and it's Facebook. And so his grandmother let me know, yeah. and I was able to go there and talk with them and, and, yeah. and, and deal with him on that. So the, these these youngsters, they post a lot of stuff on uh, Facebook, and, you, and from there you can know who, what gang they're running with or who is uh, uh, working on them to try to get them to join the gang and what they're thinking is about that. Mm -hmm. At least that's one perspective. <laughs> and then the kids give you the sign. You know what I mean? So don't want to sign up for the help. You know, if you really truly so look at it back then, there was no such thing as all of his, what is it, my, my space or my face? Facebook. <laughs> gang bang. Twitter. You know, gang bang. Twitter, gang bang. Yeah. 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 That was just unheard of. You know what I mean? Yeah, I had asked the um, gang suppression team, I'm like, well, is this something that we should be educating our kids on to not post? And they're like, no, this is so helpful for us to be able to track, because I know that I've seen kids who are posting stuff on Instagram and things like that. So um, it is it is one of the main ways that you know they can monitor them, and then also they can let other people know. And a lot of these websites come up from like gang members posting comments and saying different things, and you can just see like you know them just kind of battling it out on, on social media. So it's really interesting. Yes. Also, yeah, also what helped me, what I'm noticing a trend amongst people that are, you know, reforming their lives is the spiritual side because they do have a spiritual connection amongst their family mm -hmm. and it's kind of reserved there and that gets them to think with the, the whole different side of the brain that can bring that inward conversion to help them then it's in their mind, and if that starts getting fed a little bit more, it, it's it's like within the mind itself, it starts saying, hey, what are you doing over here? Because that, that's where that awakening, or that I saw the light, or I've been illuminated. That helps, if it can help, I mean, if, well, think about it. Some of you guys, if you, if you tap into your spirit, spirituality, what does it do for you? Well, that same connection can happen with 
for this week. So and that's where you start. You start to focusing, focusing on the individual as a as a being, as the wholeness of that person, not just physical, emotional, or you know, mental, mental, but also the, the person's spirit. And if that side gets tapped into, and if you water it, it starts to grow. It's going to help. Any other kind of, um, one of the questions, I know you guys talked about this before, but I think as professionals, this is something that we really face a lot, is that for kids who are so heavily involved with no intentions of getting out, a lot of us feel powerless, and we go in and we keep seeing the kid kind of subscribing to that lifestyle, and we, we can kind of educate them, talk to them, say we're gonna take you to Donovan, we're gonna do different intervention services, but it's really hard, it's, it's so hard. So I was wondering, again, I know you said listening, any other thoughts around that, that we can do as professionals so that we don't lose motivation or discouragement around stuff? That you don't lose discouragement? Well, I mean, the idea that like, I think it's hard as providers, we get burnt out by going in and seeing stuff, and after you know a while, when a kid is blowing us off, not coming to meetings, it does weigh on us, unfortunately, as professionals. And so is there anything that we can kind of keep in mind to keep us focused? I would say um, just stay, just make more of a personal protection. That is make you want to be more involved. But one of the things I'm thinking of is when they talk about the gay expression and how they talk to you and treat you, things like that. That's one of the, 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 the mindsets that we're trying to change overall is um, uh, the approach with with these folks, you know, is not to look at them as though they're the enemy and, and, and talk down to them, treat them in kind of way, but build a relationship. But even, you know, uh, give examples of Daniel, you know, uh, one of the things you're trying to get through, I'm saying, you know, you got to start building a relationship with these guys. You got to like, when you're talking about the meeting, sometimes you may have to cut them off, yeah. you know, just, just to build a relationship, get them to trust. Now, and it's not about being a CI, confident informant, and all that. It's more so, I'm concerned about you, I care about you. And that's, that's the thing, if you really care, and you're really concerned, yes, you might, your heart might be broken many times, and you will be let down many times, because they're not gonna stop until they're ready. But if, but if you have that passion, and that love, and that care, and that concern for these individuals, then that's what's gonna keep you moving, keep you going on. If it's just a paycheck, you know, hey, I, I'm coming to work, clocking in, that's it, then yeah, you, you, you're gonna lose your motivation, you're gonna get discouraged because this is hard work dealing with these young specialists. If they are in the game, most of the time they're not gonna get out until they're ready to get out unless you're able to make a connect and click, get something clicking or whatever. But like I said before, you know, um, if you have that passion and if you lead them in a positive way and show them some positive things that you do, one of the things I do when I sit down with young people is uh, I ask them to make a commitment to work with you. I, you know, I'm not here to get you out of the game, I'm not here to do none of this, but make a commitment with me to work with me on this, and, and, I, and I guarantee that I'll stick with you. I won't drop you, um, uh, and <laughs> a lot of times, a lot of times, even if it costs me my life, I'll be here for you. So, you know, I kind of, you know, put it on a level where they can understand, like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be your real one, you know, but on a different level, and, and so on. And I think when they see that you're committed, and when they see that you really care, they'll start opening up. And you'll read something, but you gotta remember, a lot of these the youngsters are not gonna change until they're ready. You're not going to change it to the way. So uh, it's got to be that passion that you have. And you're going to connect with some people. And you're going to see the change. And that's what's going to really be the encouragement to move forward. Uh, I can make a difference. I am making a difference. Mm -hmm. Not just one, but a few people. Uh, I would just say just be there. Be there for them. And they need you. That's like you were saying, too. It's like planting a seed. Yeah. Plant that seed there. It's not, there's no. There's no guarantee it's gonna grow right there. You might not even you might not even do nothing for them right there. But three, four years down the line they're gonna remember. Yeah. And then when they're ready, on their time, that seed's gonna grow. And they'll go out. Hopefully. <laughs> some some never do. Some never some dudes are 50, 60 years old and still game man. But the only thing you can do is just hope to be and just do what you can do what you can, be there for them, help them, try to be a good influence. Be a positive role model for, for them to be an example. I kind of wanted to go back to safe places, I guess, because we all work for nonprofit because we want to help. We're giving our lives to an extent to come in and help these kids. We don't make a lot of money. Um, but I certainly want to go home to my family. I have responsibilities at home. I have people I'm accountable to at home. So what what can we look for? Like I'm calling and saying something is delicious, like something that's like a tip for us to go, like uh, maybe today is out of the day, maybe we could try it. Gunshots? <laughs> well, that, I mean, yeah, but is there something else we should be looking for that you guys might know that we would take for granted that we might not know something about the past? You mean if you're in the home? 
home or do it through work? Um, that's kind of difficult because when you start steer review, you kind of fall into a stereotypical type of thing and pre judgment and, and look at a situation on the outside and really not know what's going on. Uh, some of the things that I uh, do, yeah, I, I go in all kinds of situations. Me and Pastor Sonbo, they can be a homicide and we go right in there talking with the family and things like that. And so, you know, but because we come from that lifestyle, we understand what. There have been some situations that I've gone into, like if I'm if I'm going in, I'm trying to talk to folks and they self-medicate, like I heard somebody talking about marijuana and things like that, and they getting they puffing and getting on high things. I know that you know I'm not going to get too far with them on that day. I try to make some connects, say hey, I'll get back with you or whatever, and things like that. You know if uh, you know I mean if, if there's some clear signs like you go up, they argue and fight, and, I mean you know to continue to, to move on unless you know that individual you can talk to. See, it's about you. And knowing the risk that you can take, you know, because if you have a relationship with a person, even if you see them out the heart and you say, hey, Johnny, come here, you know, and he'll come over there and start talking, what's going on, you okay, blah, blah, blah. And you might be able to, to calm the situation, but at the same time, if you are familiarized with all of that, then yes, you get out of there yeah. and you leave, you know, you don't, you don't put yourself in a violent situation. But it's kind of hard just looking, because, you know, even if there's a bunch of guys hanging out, that don't mean that you're going into a violent situation. Those would be some of the most friendly and <laughs> person that you know. So it's hard to tell with that, but I think, you know, with me, when he's drinking and when he's smoking dough and things like that, I know I'm not going to be able to do too much at that moment, at that time. And if there's a lot of hostility, they're upset about something as you begin to talk, okay, you know, let me shut this down right now and, and uh, I'll get back and you know, come back in another time. Also, if you want to know what's going on in that community, like you can go on like crimemapping.com, put in the zip code, put like a mile, mile radius, or even uh, it'll give you, it'll give it to you down to the block. Because if there was a shooting that happened that weekend or a stabbing, something happened there, that that just for your own awareness to know how they're feeling, because it, the community gets impacted as well, not just the individual, but the parents, the community, the whole apartment complex. Two guys just shot and killed each other this weekend. Yeah. And the person doesn't know that and coming in, and if you know, you're in a different state of mind. So knowing what, what happened, so crimemapping.com, put in the zip code, and it'll tell you the crime, the sim little symbols, but it'll tell you the type of crimes that were committed that weekend, that week. Well, is that something, so let's say we're going in and we know that a shooting happened the day before. Does that usually bring people to a place where it's kind of calm and you know somber and sadness? Or is that like we're enraged and now everybody's both, both extremes, but it's a good a good segue into safety planning. Yeah. A good segue into how you guys doing, what's happening here, and when you're, you're coming from that approach, you know, life and death, and you're you're part of that conversation. Like, whoa, oh, you know what happened? Yeah, I heard it. Then you look up the article, little things like that, stuff that's just open to the public. You're like, wow, this person knows what's up. They know what's going on, and uh, and they're concerned. They're asking about it. And then right there, you're, you're, you're connecting. Yeah, informed and aware. Mm -hmm. So, uh, this might take off track, but when you guys are running into people that you used to be in the with that are still in, how, how does that work out? Like, for the youth that are, well, thinking about maybe leaving, but I'm going to be on my own. And, and they probably really are, like, on their own once you leave the game. But how is it when you interact, when you run into some of those, some of your old affiliates afterwards, you know? What's that like?